Okay, so uh, this part is about uh, introducing the binocular rivalry as a potent tool for the MCC research. And uh, this is a uh, schematic from uh, Chris Ferris's paper in 1999, uh, uh, and uh, depicting as a uh, uh, binocular rivalry, bino depicting binocular rivalry as a paradigm uh, situation of the uh, perception, subject experience changes without the stimulation and the behavior remains constant. And here the behavior remains constant part is a bit problematic because people um, can report the person. But we are uh, binocular rivalry in this case, you don't need to report and then still uh, experience changes without stimulation. So that's um, you know already forcing what's called a no report paradigm in a sense. So um, here's the, uh, different uh, ways to uh, set up the binocular rivalry experiments. Um, the most uh, easy kind of setup, um, if we were to do this lecture in on, uh, not online, but in, in the lecture hall, I would actually give this in red green filter to each of you and then let them you uh, let them uh, let you, you know, um, see this image, for example. Then through the uh, red filter, uh, you see only face and then through the green filter, you see the house. And then um, the percept of the uh, face and the uh, uh, house alternates between them. That's one typical binocular rivalry experiment. And also this uh, can be also done by uh, using a, a four sets of the meter uh, like this way, and then see completely different image uh, with, uh, without any kind of leakage of the uh, color or um, uh, any kind of uh, constraint to see completely different image on the left eye and the right eye. That's also another typical um, uh, set. And then uh, in fMRI, uh, you can also do uh, this kind of thing without introducing meters or uh, filter by having a prism and then uh, see uh, bend the uh, light direction just in front of you and then uh, see different images through this uh, kind of occluder. This is like a sort of the glass in front of you, but they are pointing into different direction. And so it's relatively easy and cheap to do. So, um, but the binocular library also doesn't require any kind of the, uh, expensive setup. So this is, uh, for example, binocular library in everyday life. Um, in, this, in this case, What you need to do is the following. So first uh, you put the finger in front of you and then uh, let's say uh, around uh, 15 centimeter or so around here. And then uh, look to the sort of the in front of your display or a uh, mirror or something like that. And then pay attention to this finger. And then what you notice is that the binocular rivalry is actually happening at the border of the fingers. And then you see sort of the, by adjusting the size, you know, um, distance between the finger, you can have a sort of a floating sausage in between the finger. And then also important thing to notice is that uh, if you don't move your eyes or blink and then focus for a while, the finger starts to get attached to the original finger or floating or two finger actually also becomes one, you know. Um, so there are three, uh, three different kind of phenomenology. One is the uh, most typical, the floating uh, sausage and two short finger. And then another is uh, the com completely connected uh, fingers. And then other two is one finger connected to the, uh, you know, the central, uh, floating sausage and so on. That's one um, binocular library experience in the everyday life. And then another one is uh, this uh, demonstration using the um, uh, paper. So for example, if you have uh, um, any kind of paper in front of you, I strongly encourage you to try this and also show it to your friends or family. So here you have a you know, paper and then you just roll it up like this. And if it's too long, it doesn't work really well, but you know, something like this length, that's fine. And then hold it uh, at the end like this, 
okay and then look at this uh hold it with the left hand and then put this hole to your right arm right eye and then if you open your eyes most of your eyes at the same time then you should see that uh, with your left eye you should be able to see your hand but with your right eye you see only hole uh, through this you know uh, column and then uh, that should coincide roughly to the hole in the face you know uh, hand and you can do something like this to make the hand more you know dramatic and uh, uh, or any kind of you know combination of things angle like this for example i don't see you know my my hand now becomes very thin there's a hole here and again you can notice that if you don't move your eyes or blink and then wait for a while then the hole gets sort of closed and then again opening up close and then open up and then now closing up and this happens uh, at the time period that is uh, sort of a, it's a peculiar for each person. You know, um, it's not deterministic. Okay. And then uh, this type of the binocular rivalry also uh, can also happen in front of the mirror. So this is the uh, relatively recent kind of a finding that we made um, and reported to the uh community science community uh last year and then published this year so this is uh, what we call a uh, third eye library to perceive this you need to go in front of the mirror and then just like standing uh 30 to 50 centimeter from the mirror and then what you're going to do is to look at uh, your right eye with your left eye and then with your right eye to look at the, your left eye. So it's like a cross, crossing eye a little bit. And then if you can achieve uh, the fixation on your one, one of your eye with um, you know, uh, both of uh, your eyes, then you can achieve some kind of you know, uh, situation where your face is composed of three eyes plus two face. And then, because the eye has a very distinct, you know, contrast, uh, you can maintain the fixation relatively easily, I think, unlike, you know, um, other cross eye or, you know, um, parallel eye visual divisions. And then if you wait for a while, then you'll see that, you know, um, only one face dominates and then the other side of the face becomes kind of a background or you know, invisible or the other way around. And then uh, what I often also see is this only one eye cyclopean kind of situation without seeing the faces. And this is also the binocular rivalry in everyday life. And uh, the fact that you know, this was published only this year means that uh, many of this type of the binocular rivalry in everyday life hasn't been uh, reported. And probably if you find some, you may be able to uh, publish as a paper. All right, so um, what, what this means, um, at least in three of these uh, example, is that the binocular library happens uh, as a sort of the, even now, uh, not, not only in this kind of artificial uh, experimental situation, but also uh, everyday life with the fingers or uh, holes, or, you know, or, you know, in front of the mirror. And what um, is causing this binocular rivalry is Essentially, uh, the discrepant image is uh, projected, uh, projected onto your right eye and the left eye retina. And then our conscious experience has this property where uh, on one occasion, you tend to see only one object at a time. Therefore, um, that's, uh, one, one of them is perceived one at a time. But it doesn't, the brain doesn't commit to one interpretation uh, all the time it switches the other other ones and that can be uh, explained in many different ways and psychologists have been uh, discussing about the mechanism for a really long time but we are going to talk about the neural correlates of consciousness using this binocular rivalry that's the uh, plan okay so uh, but having said that uh, first uh, important kind of thing to realize is that uh, 
there are lots of uh, lots of psychophysics experiments uh, done on the binocular rivalry, and we know quite a bit about the property of the binocular rivalry, from individual difference to the property of the um, rhythm and also the property of the images that causes that. So, for example, the left side is a typical uh, a histogram of the duration uh, of the binocular rivalry. Uh, this is again from one of our papers that. Uh, Let's say, you know, um, in this particular situation of the binocular rivalry, then the switch between the left eye to right eye happens most, you know, frequently with a frequency, uh, you know, duration of 2.5 seconds or something like that. So you see one image with the right eye for 2.5 and then the another one for 2.1. And sometimes it's very short, like, you know, only a fraction of a second. And then sometimes it can be really long, right? Like, you know, 10 seconds or 15 seconds. It's quite um, remarkable that if you try this or a third eye library or this, you know, a column thing, that um, you feel like you can control the time, um, the duration of binocular rivalry. But uh, if you control many things very carefully, especially blink and eye movements, it turns out that uh, you can't really control binocular rivalry. And the rivalry happens mostly uh, involuntary and with uh, much of the uh, effects of attention, almost like minimum compared to other types of the binocular, uh, the bistable illusion. So, um, so this uh, type of the distribution is called the gamma distribution, and that's uh, one of the binocular rivalry property. Okay, and then uh, the other one is that uh, contrast dependency. So, here, for example, if I present uh, the left eye hundred percent you know, uh, contrast uh, grating, and then the right eye uh, is uh, uh, horizontal grating. And then this proportion of the um, contrast could be like X percent, and the X goes from uh, 0 0.3 to 1.0, okay? So this is a right eye contrast in this situation. And then it's very counterintuitive in the beginning, but what, what it means is that the uh, as you make the strengths of this thing, you know, from really faint kind of horizontal to very, very strong horizontal gradient, what happens is not the dominance duration of the, this grating to change a lot. So what it means is that the, even if it's very weak, it dominates roughly two seconds on average, and then uh, even if very, very strong, 100% contrast, it still dominates only like 2.5 seconds. So the peak here, or mean, doesn't change as a function of the strengths of the contrast of the stimulus itself. However, what changes is that the, if this one becomes weaker and weaker, then left eye grating, Okay, in this case, it's a bar, um, vertical grating that becomes really long in dominance, uh, dominance. So each time it becomes visible, it gets visible for, let's say, you know, on average, eight seconds. And then come back to the uh, right eye, but it's only, you know, dominant for two seconds and so on. And then as the duration of uh, the, the strength of the right eye becomes stronger and stronger, and then to the extent that it becomes now the same, then the, the dominance duration becomes more or the same, left and right, right eye. In this particular subject or experiment, left eye still had some kind of, you know, dominance, but mostly, you know, uh, uh, this becomes, you know, uh, same uh, when the contrast becomes the same. This is a very peculiar per, uh, property and not so many people um, uh, don't know about this. And so this can be used as a sort of a check of whether the subject um, is doing the task properly or not uh, through the experimental uh, analysis of this uh, test. And this can be applied to animals or patients or kids or whatever, okay? So this is important. All right. So now um, also, you know, I wanted to uh, introduce the technique that I discovered when I was a graduate student. Um, but here, 
In fact, uh, the, the reason why I discovered this illusion was uh, because I was translating uh, chapter 16 of the Crystal Fox book uh, at the mi middle of the night, like 2 a.m. or um, 1 a.m. or something like that. And then if you read that chapter, you will encounter that uh, the discussion about binocular rivalry and so flash suppression. So flash suppression is similar to binocular rivalry, but you present the stimulus uh, to left eye and then introduce the second stimulus to the right eye later. And then if you do that, uh, right eye stimulus tends to become dominant. And uh, usually up until that time, uh, flash suppression and binocular rivalry was uh, kind of uh, treated as uh, related but uh, distinct phenomena. And then while I was uh, translating that uh, chapter, I just came up with this idea of, okay, so if I intermix binocular rivalry and the flash suppression, what happens? And then I went back to the laboratory in the midnight and then uh, programmed this uh, stimulus. And then what I found was that um, this, you know, uh, the other stimulus that, uh, you know, kept on sort of doing the flash suppression dominated for a really, really long time. And at that time, I couldn't see the suppressed stimulus for a long time. So I even doubted uh, uh, maybe the bug of the program. But it turned out that you know, it is a discovery of this you know, situation of continuous flash suppression. But basically what it means is that uh, here, one uh, side of the uh, eye receives a stationary image, let's say even the angry face or something like that. And that was considered at that time very, very difficult to suppress in a binocular rivalry. The face is super salient and the emotional stimulus makes it also very difficult to suppress it. However, when I flashed the other image to the other eye, at the roughly the period of 100 milliseconds one, uh, you know, uh, for one image, and then I don't repeat the same image. So here I'm um, using like, let's say 64 patterns of the different, you know, uh, Mondrian, like, um, you know, um, abstract, you know, images then most likely because uh, this uh, image is uh, effective to stimulate the binocular uh, and the, um, the neurons in a visual cortex throughout the visual cortex V1 to V2 and so on uh, because it has a lots of edges that is a very effective stimulus to you know activate various neurons and also because I don't you know uh, let them adapt for each of the neuron um, it responds to the onset, but you know, the next one comes 100 milliseconds after, and the different neurons are evoked um, by the you know, next flash. And because this one, uh, in a sense, you know, avoid any adaptation, as you saw experience last week, um, it is very effective in driving the other eye uh, for a long time. And then as a result, the percept uh, is dominated by this uh, flashing you know, um, stimulus. And this is very, uh, it turns out to be a very uh, potent stimulus. And then um, it allows us to uh, study the uh, non-conscious processing of the brain uh, quite effectively. And uh, some of the uh, insights about the consciousness and attention uh, comes from the result of this uh, continuous flash suppression technique uh, from next week. Okay. And some of your um, uh, tutorial presentation dependent, uh, depended on the um, continuous flash suppression, CFS. Now, um, uh, just a quick sort of, you know, um, uh, explanation of what is a potential neuronal uh, models or binocular rivalry or CFS. So here, um, the key finding is uh, this thing. Um, that um, strength of the one eye's uh, stimulus does not change the dominance duration, but the other eye's uh, dominance, okay? So that's the key component to explain and also expect what types of the neural mechanism responsible for binocular rivalry and also uh, CFS. So here, uh, the retina and the LGN and up to V1 is uh, expected to more or less, you know, uh, generate our um, retinotopic response to the left eye and the right eye. And then within V1, uh, at least layer four, uh, 
the neurons are responding to only input from right, left eye or right eye. And then even though uh, after that, it becomes sort of merging to binocular, rima, uh, binocular neurons, there is always a preference from left eye or right eye and so on. And then one um, important insight is that uh, same orientation uh, preferring the neurons are likely to be exciting each other, okay? That's a uh, red arrow. And the different orientations are inhibiting each other. So this uh, is a very nice kind of situation to uh, uh, expect how this, you know, transpiral uh, uh, image or, you know, usual binocular situation to uh, uh, arise, right? Left eye and the right eye tend to see something very similar. And if the left eye input and the right eye input is the same, then they tend to uh, facilitate each other. However, unlike uh, the normal situation, if there is an uh, uh, binocular uh, incongruence, so left eye is uh, uh, receiving this you know, uh, vertical and the right eye is receiving this horizontal, then they are trying to inhibit each other, okay? Right eye is saying that it should be, you know, uh, horizontal. Left eye is saying that uh, it should be vertical. And um, this inhibition is uh, making somewhat, you know, once this guy, right eye starts to, buy, uh, you know, uh, win, then that starts to inhibit uh, left. So, you know, um, it becomes, uh, you know, uh, uh, it facilitates a clear winner. But this guy, uh, right eye, you know, preferring neuron starts to adapt and its response to goes down. And then that allows this left eye neuron to become dominant and then now that uh, uh, switch happens. And this uh, continues on and on. And that's the binocular rivalry neural modeling. And also, an uh, uh, important thing is uh, that here, the effects of one's activation is mainly on the other eye's neurons through this inhibition. And that's the reason why uh, one stimulus is uh, uh, strong, you know, as the neurons, let's say, uh, as our uh, input to the right eye becomes stronger, it doesn't have a sort of the sustained input to make it more sort of the um, dominant, but the duration of the the other eye becomes uh, shorter through the strengthening of this inhibition and vice versa. So that's the sort of the minimum model of the binocular rivalry. And still there are lots of you know, remaining questions about binocular rivalry. And this relates to also um, uh, somewhat um, uh, relate, relating to the neural correlates of consciousness, okay? So for example, what is the mechanism, neural mechanism of the suppression is still unclear. And what is the fate of the suppressor stimulus? So sub suppressor stimulus becomes consciously unavailable, invisible, but um, can it actually affect our behavior? So that's a sort of the question about non-conscious uh, processing, uh, scope and the limits of the non-conscious processing. And the third is uh, how does the nature of the stimuli affect a binocular rivalry or CFS. As I mentioned, in the case of the binocular rivalry, angry stimulus, for example, is very difficult to completely suppress, but uh, CFS can suppress it. And CFS utilizes the Mondrian-like patterns and that prolongs this you know, binocular suppression. So there are lots of questions about you know, what kind of situation or stimuli uh, achieves the uh, best suppression or weaker suppression and so on. That's uh, sort of the, another question. Also, another question would be that uh, what is a neural correlate of the visible and the invisible stimuli? Not, it's sort of related to num number two, but also um, what is a neural activity that corresponds to visible and uh, invisible stimuli? And then finally, the, what is a neural mechanism of the perceptual switches? Um, this also becomes important under the uh, no report paradigm discussion in um, two weeks from now. So in sum, in this section, I introduced the binocular rivalry and that there it happens in everyday life and under the constant stimulation of uh, uh, binocular rivalry, conscious person trips between two alternatives in a random manner and CFS can suppress the stimulus in a more reliable and longer duration. Uh, but a precise mechanism of um, binocular rivalry or CFS are still unknown.
And what is the neural activity during middle care library is the one um, that we address in the next video.